and 300. Okay. Whew. That was, uh, yeah, got my heart going. Just kidding. I don't actually have 300. I'm not even wearing a watch. Uh, but what's up, guys? Mason the Brock Henderson here. And whew, first time that I think I felt this much tension in a match for Chelsea in a long, long time. Because honestly, even the games that we've won, they've not really felt convincing. They've not really felt like exciting matches to watch. It's just kind of, I've resigned myself to, I, I'm expecting, you know, us to fail. I'm expecting us not to do well because we haven't shown any sign of turning things around. This was the first game that I actually felt like things might possibly turn around. Like, there's still a good chance that we'll just lose the next 20 games and get relegated. There, there's still a good chance that that will happen. But, based on this match... There's some positives going forward. There's something to look forward to, even with Potter in charge, because he actually did some smart things tonight. So, I don't know if this was just a fluke, if this was something where he made the right change but for the wrong reason, and so the next match he's going to change it up again and it's going to go back to being shit. I don't know for sure. But, yeah, I mean, I'll, I will give credit where credit's due. Potter did a good job of setting us up tonight. And I will talk about why. First of all, keeping the back three and, you know, the wing backs and all of that, it works for what we have right now. And honestly, I, I think it's really kind of what we need to stick with. Even though we do have these players that typically are more wingers, we have some great wing backs. You know, James, he's okay as a fullback, but honestly, he's better when he's able to get a f further forward. You know, Chilwell, same thing. Kukurea, he doesn't hurt us if he's a wingback. He might hurt us if he's a fullback. So it really sets us up to be a lot more progressive down the wings because they will stay wide for the most part. You know, you'll have your occasional Marcus Alonso who will decide he wants to play striker. But for the most part, we do have wingbacks that like to stay wide. They do hug the line. And that's what we need. That's what we need. There's players out there to give us the width because we haven't had that so far most of the season. You know, our wings typically tuck inside and our fullbacks don't really get down the line as much because they have to make sure they're not losing track of their man behind them. So, yeah, I feel like this system does set us up better. It allows for one defender to be a little bit deeper than the other two. Now, granted, without Silva back there, we do look a little weak, and I will discuss that in a little bit when I talk about the defense. Um, we don't really have a true leader back there who's going to organize from deep like Silva does. Um, so that is something we'll need to look at going forward, but it still provides the best, in my opinion, depth and coverage for our defense, because we do have some error-prone defenders right now, because, <laughs> I mean, Kukurea, Koulibaly, Fafana, all of them have their moments where they go diving into challenges that they shouldn't, or they get beat by a simple one-two, so it allows us to have a little bit more coverage, and I feel like that helps us whenever we're, you know, struggling to keep up with the pace of the passing. In the midfield, that's probably where we look our weakest in this formation. And that's something that we got to address going forward, just with the transfers and stuff. We do need a better midfield. Whether it's a midfield two or a midfield three, we need better midfielders in there who are going to be better at controlling the game. Because right now, if we have possession, they do fine. You know, Fernandez, Kovacic, Loftus Cheek, even Gallagher, when they're on the ball, they're fine. Defensively, they all have their issues. So we, de we definitely need to go get a uh, defensive midfielder who can actually defend well. You know, your Conte or Rice, Matic when he was here. You know, they are defensive midfielders. They can actually defend well. Um, so that's probably the weakest part. But then even up top, you know, we had the three. We had, Fe uh, I've been saying Felix, it's Felix. I don't know if anybody gets offended by that. If so, <laughs> get off my channel. Um, but Felix, Sterling, and Havertz. So same front three. But the one change that Potter made that, first of all, blew my mind that he decided to make it in the first place, second of all, made us look better going forward, dropped Havertz deep. So instead of a, a three like this, where you got your front man, you got your two behind, it was more of a two up front and one behind, and Havertz was the one behind, and it looked so much better. He was dropping deeper, he was getting on the ball, the guys were you know, running in front of him, which allowed him to make runs off of them, instead of players trying to make runs off of him, because he doesn't do that. <laughs> so it just it felt like we had a much 
better attacking fluidity because he was allowed to drop deeper and do what he does best. It's like Potter woke up this morning and just had a revelation like, oh, Havertz is not a striker. <laughs> it's just amazing that he actually made that change. Now, granted, it did mean that we didn't really have anybody being the, the target man up there. We didn't have a true number nine today. Um, it was kind of... Sterling was really the one that was making those you know, runs in behind the defense. Um, granted, he did hurt a little bit for it. Obviously, he got himself a goal, which is great, but he felt like he was sort of out of the match and isolated for large chunks of it because of that. And a lot of that just comes down to he's also not a striker, so he's also not going to know what runs to make. However, he does make runs, and that's something that Havertz was not doing for us, that at least Sterling's not timing his runs well. You know, he's basically running into the, the wide channels, which is kind of what we need from him. Um, but he's still at least doing something. He's trying to move the defense around, and that in it of itself is enough to open up space for Felix to run into, for Havertz to run into. So it's just, it's so nice having somebody up there who's actually going to move for us. Even though we're not going to get him the ball a whole lot, even though he's going to be offsides quite a few times, it's still... It's nice. It's nice to have somebody up there who moves, <laughs> unlike Havertz. Um, so yeah, from Potter's point of view, obviously still have you know the slight issue. Like, don't really like Kukurea back in there. I feel like Chalaba is a better option defensively, but you know that's that's my own personal preference. Um, I think that was about it. Like as far as player selection goes, subs. You know, there, there are certain players that I would have liked to see come in. Um, but, I mean, it's it's more my own personal preference than it actually is his his problems, you know, what he's doing wrong. So, yeah, I really don't have a whole lot of complaints about Potter tonight. They're just few and far between. And that, in my opinion, is a step in the right direction. You know, and it needs to be more consistent, obviously. I can't just have this one game where I didn't have problems with him, and this is the first time since he came in, basically. <laughs> um but it at least shows me he does have somewhat of a sense. He does at least know what the right option is because he showed he made those right choices today. So going forward, if he continues to make the wrong choices, if he goes back to using Havertz as our number nine, then I'm going to sit here and go, okay, so you know, you, you did this one time and you saw, okay, look at the benefits of it. Why would you go back to something that wasn't working? So we'll see where it goes from here, but... Yeah, it's the first sign for me that maybe Potter can be a long-term manager. Um, I'm still not fully convinced. Obviously, he's got a lot to prove <laughs> for a lot of us, I think, because we've been struggling for so, so long that, yeah, we're, we're a little pissed. We're a little like, okay, one win, it's a good win, it's a good performance, but it's not exactly wiping a record clean. We have a lot to, to show for why you're not going to work as a manager and then this little bit is like, okay, maybe he can. <laughs> so, but anyways, on to, well, I guess on to the controversy of the match. Because, yeah, so I saw some posts about the handball. Here's the thing. First of all, the guy was just awful in the second half for us. Like, if you watch the match, so many moments of just these little nothing fouls where the Dortmund player goes over and he's just like, oh, I got you, bud. It's so many things like that. He really called a very tight game like he almost didn't want any contact like he was calling it tight early on but definitely in the second half it felt a little bit more leaning towards Dortmund's side but the penalty it is a penalty and honestly it's it's not as much of a penalty ironically as the one that we should have gotten against West Ham where the defender you know slid in and made this the great save um but it still is and I, I know it's hard to see because I'm a little bit lower but it's one of those where his hand is down and then comes up, and he, he had his hand out. You know, it's away from his body. It's making himself slightly bigger. If it's one of those where his arm's down here by his side, and he turns, and it hits here, that's one thing. But when it's turn and out, <laughs> and it hits there, that's a penalty. So, I, I know, obviously, Dortmund fans and people who don't like Chelsea, they will, of course, say, well, there's no way that's a penalty. It's too close. His arm's right next to his body. But the fact of the matter is, his arm's out. It's out away from his body, and he moved it up as the ball's going up. If he hadn't moved his arm up, the ball would have gone over his arm. So, that's the fact of it. Um, 
I will say, I do want some clarification on the rule about taking a, you know, the retake of the penalty, because, yeah, I don't, because I saw some other arguments going on about that one. Um, I thought it was like, you know, because the guy encroached in the box and he was the one that made the clearance, I thought that's why, whereas, you know, Chilwell, he was also inside the box, but the ball didn't come hit to him and he finished. If he had finished, that would have just been indirect kick there because you encroached. So I feel like that's the rule, but I actually don't know the rule as to if that's the case. If it's like the player who touched, if they encroached, if they're on the attacking team, it's going the other way. If they're on the defending team, it's a retake. I think that's the rule, but then again, I could be wrong. So I don't know. But yeah, a little bit of luck there, and I will talk about Havertz when I get to him. But um, yeah, I, I really don't think that there's much controversy there. And honestly, there was some other controversial stuff going on by the end of the game, you know, the temper, temperature rising and some of the tempers flaring and stuff and shoving going on. I feel like there was a couple things that he probably missed um, or didn't give cards for that maybe should have been cards. So, but, you know, that's always the referees. Referees going to cause problems one way or another. <laughs> Just got to deal with it. But as far as individual performances, Keppa, for me today, again, showed some of his quality. You know, he wasn't... I don't think, again, he did anything that was super, like, holy crap. There were some saves that were very good reaction saves, but for the most part, he did good. The one thing that I will say is that free kick is typically the one that he would just watch go in. So the fact that he actually did take a step and get across to it, make the save, that for me pushes him from a, he did okay today, he made some good saves, to he kept us in the game. That save right there... It's not a Kepa save to make. So it's good to see him starting to step outside of that realm a little bit. The realm of just, oh, well, I can make, you know, saves that are within my, my reach. Because he has all, he's always done that very well. It's the ones that are outside of his reach. Can he actually move his feet and get across to get there? And that one he did. So I will say bravo to Kepa today for that. <laughs> it's, it's ironic because he made all these other saves that were pretty good. You know, some of them were good or great, close to great. That, for me, was the one that made me go, that's that's a good save. For him, that is a really good save to make. And I hope it's a sign that he's... Because he's had a couple games where he's watched a couple go in recently. So to see him save that one gave me a little hope that, like, okay, maybe he's not slipping back into his old habits. Maybe he is, you know, back on the, the upturn. So we'll see how he goes from here. The back three, uh, Fafana... A little bit of a shaking game today again and I think a lot of people because I didn't see many people talking about some of his mistakes in the the Leeds game I think the goal kind of wiped a lot of those mistakes away but he still is a very error prone defender and it's funny because I even made a comment because somebody was uh, made a post about all these young defenders that we have you know like Fafana, Betty Ashil, um, Colwell like they, they made a list of all of these good defenders and they left Chalaba out I'm like so first the coaches overlooked Chalaba, and now all these Chelsea pages are overlooking Chalaba. Somebody came back, well, Chalaba's just an error-prone defender. <laughs> do, do you not watch Wesley Fofana? <laughs> like, he's not a great defender. He's solid. He puts his body on the line, and I will give him credit for that. But, yeah, his one-on-one -on -one man marking defending is not the best. You know, there are several moments where he's getting caught stepping out whenever he really shouldn't be, and leaves ton of space in behind him to run into so yeah a little bit too much diving in from him today and it it felt a little bit more noticeable for me today just because I feel like Dortmund moved the ball a lot quicker than Leeds did it happened a couple times against Leeds but not nearly as much as it happened today because Dortmund's just a better team so but there were several times where he got passed by way too easily um, but again he puts himself on the line he blocks a couple of shots so for that, I will say I do appreciate his effort in the box. But yeah, <laughs> I am a little concerned watching how easy it was to pass through our defense a couple times. Uh, Koulibaly is kind of the same way. You know, he's a defender. He'll put his body on the line. He's very tough, very good in the air. But yeah, sometimes goes flying out into a challenge that he doesn't need to make and suddenly, boom, boom, right past him. And there you go. <laughs> um, actually... On Fafana, one other thing that just popped into my head, the save that Kepa ha had to make on the free kick that was really, really good, 
that comes from Fafana sticking his leg in where it doesn't need to be and tripping up Reyna right on the edge of the box. So they're both very similar in the fact that they tend to just go flying everywhere. You know, they're very energetic and very aggressive defenders, which is fine, but they're a little too much. You know, there's there's a moment where you realize you have to come and you have to slow down and keep them in front of you, basically. Um, but most of the time, it's full force. They're going in to win it, and if they don't win it, well, they're beat. Um, and unfortunately, that happened quite a few times today for both of them. So, But like I said, I do think the back three gives them the solidity of if they do go make that challenge, well, at least they have somebody else covering behind them, whereas if it's just the two, one of them goes and steps out, the other one may be right here next to them, and now all of a sudden step out and beat, and now this guy cast, he can't recover. So, um, Kukure on the left side, he's okay, you know, and I, maybe it's because I'm not a big fan of Kukure, and I feel like he's definitely not worth the price tag that we paid for him, but it just feels like sometimes he does, it's not that he doesn't work hard, you know, he does fly all over the field, he's very energetic, you, you see him going, and he's just like a little, <laughs> I can't even think what to, to liken him to, but he's just very, pacey and all over the place you know he's chasing everything the problem is that he chases a lot and I feel like that's where my issue with him is you know especially defensively there was one point where he chased into the midfield and the guy kept the ball and he just kept going after the guy basically all the way to the other side of the field now granted I'm pretty sure everybody ended up covering that space fine you know somebody stepped in I think one of the midfielders stepped into his space to make sure it was covered but that's still, you can't just go chasing the ball all the way across the field just because one guy has it. You're, you're just wearing yourself out. You know, like, have somebody else help step to you. Talk to your teammates and lead them into an area instead of just, I'm just going to I'm gonna chase you, I'm going to get the ball. I'm going to get the ball. That's all I'm going to do. I'm going to get the ball. He seems very one-track-minded in that sense. So, I don't know. Today wasn't a bad performance from him, but I still don't really see the benefit of having him out there. I don't really see what he brings to the team outside of that pace and energy. And even then, sometimes it's wasted because all he's doing is just chasing. So, again, maybe that's just my own personal bias. Maybe I'm just not a big fan of Kukurea. But, yeah, today, it, it felt like watching how hard he worked, I should have been saying, oh, wow, is playing well today. I still didn't feel it. <laughs> watching him play, I still felt like it was just, he's just, running around a lot. Um, James on the right side, again, he looks better at wing back. Still not quite what I expect from him, though. Like, he has set the standard so very high for himself with some of his performances that games like today, where most of the time you play how he did today, you're going to say, hey, he had a good game. You know, he got in some dangerous areas, put in some good crosses. He did fine. But I don't expect that from James. I expect it to be he had a great game every single game because he has shown his quality so so often um, and so consistently too so it is a little concerning that it feels like since he's come back from the most recent injury he had he's not quite been at the same level it feels like he's been a little too slow a little too nonchalant you know and that's he typically plays a little nonchalant but it feels like he's at least being productive now he's not producing anything he's not assisting he's not scoring He's occasionally putting in a cross that does lead to a chance, but most of his crosses just sort of look dangerous, but aren't. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know what's going on with him. I don't know if he's just still recovering from injury. I know he was out in the last match, um, so maybe he is still dealing with something that's just sort of bugging him. But, yeah, it's just he didn't play poorly. He just didn't play at the same level that I'm used to seeing him play. So that's... <laughs> it's weird, but that's just how it is, unfortunately. Uh, Chilwell on the left side, I thought had another pretty solid game today. He got himself dangerous areas. Um, he did create some good chances when he got on the ball. And honestly, I feel like he's showing why we need him at left wing back. You know, not at l left back. Because he really does... He creates some really good chances and opportunities with how well he interplays. You know, amongst everybody else and knocking it around in and out little one twos around the defenders he's very good at that and he's very good at connecting with whoever's over there whether it's Felix whether it's Sterling whether um who came on later who was up there I think Pulisic stepped over to that side at one point Havertz sometimes would glide over there and he would still 
you know, connect those passes really well. So he's just a good outlet to have. And especially when we're we're looking for that out that long ball, the long ball option. Who do we have? Typically he's out there in space, you just dump it over the defense, and he's gonna get there. Whether he's in behind the defense, you know, that all depends on the defender that's over there and whether they're quick enough to keep up with him or not. But he's just so often available. And he gives you something out there to, to find a pass, to get out of trouble. So, yeah, I really appreciate the work that he's putting in for the past couple of games and how effective and how how good of a, I guess, reliever he is. You know, all the pressure that's coming on and just constantly pressure, 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 and then we win it back. And somehow you get it out to Chilwell, he'll find a way to ease that pressure a little bit, take a little bit of the sting out of their attack and just keep the ball moving in a way where we're not necessarily negative and we're not putting ourselves under pressure, but we're still you know keeping the ball and keeping that possession in a way that feels effective and feels progressive. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm liking what I'm seeing from him for the past few matches. In the midfield, Kovacic and uh, Fernandez again, and they're a pretty solid pairing. You know, they knock the ball around, around between them very well. Um, Kovacic today did look better. I thought, you know, against Leeds, he did look a little off the pace. I thought today he stepped it up a bit. Um, so he looks like he's getting back to that full fitness, and hopefully he can find it again because um, we do we do need him at full fitness because the way he can just break out of the, the high press and <laughs> basically take on players and dribble down the field, it's very effective, and it's it's dangerous for the other team, you know, because you let him run, suddenly now it's a counterattack if you just give him a little bit of space. So, yeah, today he looked a lot better, and then Fernandez, I thought, connected with him better today. You know, because that was something against Leeds, they didn't connect with their passes very well. It felt like they were sort of missing each other a little bit. Today, it felt like they knew what each other was doing. They would knock it, you know, <laughs> a little one-two round uh, a, an attacking midfielder, and it just felt like there was an understanding between the two of them. So defensively, they both still struggled. They got passed around too easily. But again, I don't think either of them are defensive midfielders. They're much better on the ball. So uh, whether we do go with kind of a midfield three and have somebody sitting deeper, you know, like Conte when he returns, or um, maybe Chalaba can play in there. I think James can play in there. Until we get you know, another defensive midfielder, I do feel like, though, we need to have that defensive presence in the midfield because we are losing those battles a, a little too much for my liking. For the front three, uh, Felix thought was pretty solid today, you know, created some dangerous chances again. His finishing still does need some work. You know, there were some moments where it felt like he should be putting the ball away or, you know, should be finding that killer pass that it's definitely a goal. But for the most part, he played well, you know, he did did what he does well, held the ball up, got uh, a dangerous pass off, and suddenly now we're, we're counterattacking. So yeah, I'm liking having him as an option up there because it feels like it's not quite the same thing, but it reminds me a bit about Hazard. You know, we get the ball to him, and he may be two or three on one, but he could find a way to get out of that pressure and open up, find a pass that opens up the play, and now all of a sudden we're able to break down the field. Felix, very similar. You know, he's not quite the same player as Hazard, but it feels like you get him the ball, even if he's under a little bit of pressure, he finds a way to get out from under that pressure and open up the play and allow us to, to counterattack. So, yeah, he's playing really well right now because uh, he had a few games where he sort of dropped off and I was worried that, you know, <laughs> just like every other Chelsea player that came in, just flying at first but then slowly just back down into nothingness. But, no, he's honestly played well. So, And then Sterling... I feel like, again, was a little bit hurt by the fact that he wasn't playing out wide, driving in. He was playing more, trying to just get in behind the defense. Um, and he has the pace, too. So I don't I don't think that was a bad idea. And Dortmund were stepping up pretty high. So it definitely was set up to be effective. Unfortunately, though, like I said, he's not a striker. So he doesn't time his runs very well. So there were some missed opportunities because of that. So that's just... The unfortunate truth of not having a striker in right now, we don't have anybody who knows how to make those runs in behind and time them well. Because um, we, we don't really have somebody who thinks like that. Most of them are used to just picking the ball up behind the defense and then running past the defense, not trying to run in behind. So, uh, But yeah, I thought overall he was fine. You know, Obviously the goal, a little bit of luck. Um, I was 
pretty disappointed at first when he swung and missed the first time, but managed to you know stand up, keep his keep his wits about him so that when it fell to him and very nicely as well, he was able to bury it. So, uh, yeah, I thought obviously the goal helps make his play look a little bit better, but I thought he at least did work decently hard. Um, maybe would have liked a little bit more from him in the second half because I did feel like he was starting to fade as the game went on, but still pretty effective uh, for the most part. And then Havertz, again, playing a little bit deeper. He looked more effective today. He looked more like what we expect to see from him, you know, just getting on the ball and making things happen, you know, trying to unlock the defense with either a good run or a good ball. And that's what we've seen from him in the past. But of course, as a number nine, he can't do any of that because he's supposed to be the one opening up space for somebody else to unlock the defense in behind. And he doesn't doesn't do that. He's waiting for the ball to get to him, and the defenders are just like, okay, well, if you're going to stand there, I'm just going to stand here and mark you, and it's going to be super easy, barely an inconvenience. Um, so, yeah, today, though, much more effective, much much more the Havertz that I want to see. Um, I will say, though, on the penalty, well, again, don't have a whole lot to complain about Potter today. When I saw the reports that Potter said Havertz was going to be the penalty kick taker, from, like, the, the main penalty kick taker. First of all, I don't know I don't know if he said that. I don't know if somebody reported that. I don't know if one of the players let it slip. I don't know how that information got, got out. But you probably don't want to mention that because most teams nowadays, they try to do stuff to put the kicker off. You know, they'll get up, they'll start talking to them and start talking, you know, a little bit of shit in their ear to try to throw them off a little bit. They'll, you know, kind of bump into them, stuff like that. So if people know who are going to be, who's going to be taking the penalty, they'll go and they'll mess with them. You know, what what I really liked was the time whenever we weren't really sure. You know, obviously Jorginho kind of took over for a little while, but there was a time when it was like, well, who's going to take it? You know, few different options that we have so I still remember there was a time when Espelicueta grabbed the ball and so everybody's trying to like mess with him and then all of a sudden as the the referee finally gets everybody out of the box hands it off to somebody else and they I think it was Mount and Mount goes and buries it so announcing that is a little weird but also why Havertz you know what is Havertz I guess maybe they probably did some penalty kick training in practice and that's that's why, but the guy has missed so many one-on-one chances. Do you really want this guy who's clearly, I mean, whether it's bad luck, whether it's just bad finishing, whether it's nerves, whether it's confidence, whatever his problem is, clearly, even in the easy chances, even in the moments where it's like, okay, well, this is like an 80, 85% chance of a goal, he's missing those chances. And you put that guy on penalties. <laughs> So when he stepped up and put it off the post, I wasn't too surprised. I even said on one of the posts that I saw about that, you're going to put the guy who's missed how many one-on-one chances in charge of basically another one-on-one chance? A little bit easier because it's not keeper right in front of you. But it's still basically one-on-one. Just miss the keeper. I don't trust him to do that. So... I mean, I'm glad he at least put the second one away, but yeah, I'm. this is what I expect if he's going to be our penalty kick taker. He's going to probably miss maybe 30, 40% of these because that's probably how many one-on-one chances he misses, even though it feels like it's all of them. So, yeah, I don't know. But, I mean, his overall play today was fine. Just that one little thing was a little frustrating. As far as the subs that came on, uh, Gallagher came on first. And he was just, you know, a little bit of energy up top because we we were lacking a little bit of pressure up there and Gallagher is someone who can bring that if you put him up top. So I do appreciate the fact that Potter does seem like he's trying to use him further forward instead of deeper because, again, he's more effective up there. So uh, then the next two were Loftus-Cheek and Pulisic on for Sterling and Kovacic. So now you've got Fernandez and Loftus-Cheek. You've got Pulisic up there kind of being the, the new false nine. And uh, lots of cheek did fine. You know, nothing spectacular, but it was kind of similar to Kovacic, just very good on the ball and getting out of that pressure. Um, but one thing I will say is I don't feel like he uses his big body in the midfield as much as I'd like for him to. Because you, know, you think about other big-bodied 
uh, midfielders, you know, Bellingham today, they typically will use their strength and their height to bully the midfield. I don't feel like Loftus-Cheek does that very often, even though he has the capability to. So it's something that I do think he needs to improve on, but his play today was fine. And then Pulisic, you know, first game back in a little while since the injury that he got. So good to see him back. Um, he did not much that I can remember. You know, had a couple moments where it looked like he might be in. Um, but, yeah, he, his runs were also mistimed as well. So just unfortunate there. Uh, then the final one was Zacharia, and he came on for Fernandez, I believe. So essentially, you know, one defensive mid for another defensive mid. He's a little bit more defensive-minded, I feel like. He's not quite the same level as some of the you know great defensive mids like Conte. But I do feel like of the other defensive mids we have here, he's probably the best defender. Um, he's the best one at reading challenges, when to, when to step in, when to poke it away. Um, and he did some of that today, which really did help sort of ease some of the pressure as the closing moments uh, were upon us. So, but yeah, all in all, I mean, it was still nerve wracking, but it's nice to feel like the game was nerve wracking. You know, because I haven't really felt that. Even the, the Leeds game, where it was one nothing, it felt more just like, my God, even if they don't score, this is embarrassing to watch because we're just letting them have this match. Um, today, it felt much more like we were on an even keel with a another good team, you know, in Dortmund. And we had we had to defend, we had to fight for it, we had to see out the, the 2 nothing result. Uh, one thing I will say that did just pop into my mind... Um, kind of my final thought. So I understand the idea of wasting time. You know, I get it. And I, I'm not a big fan of it, even when we do it. I'm not a big fan of seeing, you know, players that will, oh, you toss me the ball for a throw-in, I pass it to my teammate. Oh, I'm taking the throw-in. Okay, throw it back to me. I'm not a big fan of that. I just, I feel like it's a little stupid. You know, it's it's one thing if you're taking your time to go get the ball. Like, that's, that's one thing, but when you're doing stupid stuff like that, it just seems like, I don't know, you seem like a douche. And I, I don't like feeling like I'm cheering for a player like that, so I'm already not a fan of that. However, one thing in particular that did piss me off at the end of the game, there were two or three moments that I can think of where we have the ball, we're attacking, and we've still got at least two, three minutes left. The first time that it happened, we had the full six minutes still left. Havertz has the ball, Gallagher top of the box, nobody on him, Havertz has a clear line to pass to him, and instead he turns around and goes toward the corner. Here's the thing, again, I get wasting time, however, you're not going to keep it over in the corner for six minutes straight, so that's already kind of a dumb thing. On top of that, what makes it worse is we did this a few times, every single time we didn't waste any time. It was just, let me go to the corner, and then we give the ball away, and they're right back at us. So you didn't waste any time. All you did was just take, like, five seconds to get over there, and then, boom, they got it back. You might as well have gone for a goal. If you're going to give the ball away that cheaply, might as well go ahead and have a shot while you're at it. Because if it comes off, guess what? Now it's 3 nothing, 3-1 on aggregate, and you don't have to worry about them going down and attacking. So that was something that did piss me off, and it's just something that, I know players are going to do it because they want to waste time and for whatever reason now people love it whenever players you know take the piss out of the other team and do stupid stuff like that. I'm just not a big fan of it so I know it's more for other people's sake. But yeah, especially from a we need to win this game and we need to win it by two, why not make it three if you have the opportunity? And again, people will say, well, because if you miss then you're just giving the ball right back. Well, we did that anyway. So if you're already giving the ball away, why not go for goal anyway? <laughs> like, it just, that's my mindset. But anyways, that's it for me. Um, again, have a little bit more hope that I can actually get excited about Chelsea. We'll see what the next game brings. But, yeah, that's all I've got. So let me know what you guys think down in the comment section below. What were your thoughts on the game today? Let me know what we can talk about and discuss. All that good stuff. Leave a like and subscribe for future Chelsea reviews. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace out.